Our New Testament reading this morning is from the book of Matthew. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 2 in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15 and 19 to 23. Matthew 2, beginning with verse 13. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Will, and thank you who are helping us with communion at the the new year, and thanks to the jazz band. You know, it's funny. I, I can speak in front of a million people and not be bothered in the least. But when I play, I am terrified. I am. I am. That's why I admire musicians who can do that. I, it's just terrifying. The only more thing for me more terrifying than playing is singing, which I just, you don't want to hear me sing. So... So uh, thank you, Jasmine. I do love playing with you guys. I enjoy it. And thank you for tolerating me. So I greatly appreciate that. So here's the question today. What will be your fresh start for 2023? We probably all have something in mind. Fresh starts can fit into several different categories. Perhaps our fresh start for the new year is a goal. We call that a resolution. Most resolutions usually relate to something material, physical. But besides a goal, a fresh start can also be represented by an attitude, one that we either want to adopt or an old attitude we wish to change. A fresh attitude can be very action-oriented, such as, I intend to save more money this year. Or it can be somewhat vague, such as, I'm going to be nicer next year. Sometimes we define a fresh start by a complete change of one's identity or lifestyle. I am going to retire. That is a big change. We are going to become parents. What a fresh start that is. I'm going to move. That is a hard fresh start. But it is a fresh start. So, there is a difference between those more fundamental types of fresh starts, which are beginnings and resolutions, which represent intentions, not beginnings, but intentions. In the Gospel of Matthew, we see both types of fresh starts in the birth of the Messiah. Resolutions and beginnings. The initiator of these fresh starts is not the people that Matthew tells us about, but God. Although Luke has elements of God's intention in the birth story of Jesus. Matthew explicitly connects the birth of Jesus to God 
in three ways. One, God's liberating activity. Two, God's prophetic activity. And three, God's plan in making sure that these things happen as God's in, God intended. I call it God's resolution. In Matthew's gospel, God's liberating, prophetic, and purposeful intent for humanity's salvation is shown to us, interestingly enough, through the geography, the geography of his narrative. The geography of Jesus' birth story in Matthew is very explicit when compared to Luke and really non-existent in Mark and in John. Now after the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. In those words from Matthew, we hear both the beginnings that the birth of Jesus would represent for humanity, and we also hear God's resolution fulfilled through the sending of the Messiah. Focusing on the actions of Joseph, as Matthew does, the details of the birth itself are practically non-existent. I mean, Matthew says little more than the fact that Jesus was born, unlike Luke. But the implications of the birth and the effect it has upon people in Matthew's story is explicit. From the humbleness of Joseph and Mary and the obscurity of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, Matthew suddenly switches to the venues of power in Israel, Jerusalem, and those in power over God's people, the priests, the political leaders, and Herod, Rome's puppet king over Palestine. When the Magi presented themselves in Herod's court to pay homage to a newborn king, Herod, his government, and the religious hierarchy in Jerusalem were alarmed. While we don't know exactly how the temple authorities responded to the Magi's news, Herod was resolved to destroy this threat to his power by deceptively requesting the Magi to tell him where the infant was residing so that he could go there and also pay him homage. An ominous threat, if there ever was one. Remember, Bethlehem was only seven miles from Jerusalem, so they didn't have to look far to find him. After the Magi found the infant and his parents, both they and Joseph were warned in a dream to make a fresh start and do it immediately. The Magi were told to return to the eastern reaches of the Roman Empire bearing the news of what they had heard and seen. While Joseph was warned to immediately that night leave for Egypt, the southern reaches of the Roman Empire. Joseph and Mary, knowing that Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem, according to the prophets, intended, I would think, to remain and raise him there. While certainly we know that the Magi intended to obey Herod's seemingly 
innocuous request. But God's resolution for humanity required a fresh start on the part of those that he called. If Joseph thought later on that he and Mary would simply raise Jesus in Egypt, which had a huge Jewish community and a synagogue after they safely arrived there, that changed when God later commanded a new and unexpected beginning for the family. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken to the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. In God's command to Joseph, to leave Egypt, we see both God's liberating and God's prophetic activity reflected in this new beginning in the life of the Messiah. The prophets, remembering God's call to Moses to liberate God's people from slavery in Egypt, declared that the Messiah would also be called out of Egypt to become the liberator of God's chosen people from spiritual bondage. Also, in the time of Matthew, Matthew wanted the Christian churches of his time to remember that Jesus had fulfilled the promises of the prophets. But Matthew showed, we remember this, that returning to settle down in Bethlehem after Herod's death was neither God's nor Joseph's intentions for Jesus. Herod did indeed die, but the fear that the birth of Jesus provoked among the religious and politically powerful in Judea and Jerusalem had not subsided. Plus there was a new king, Herod's son, Archelaus, who was pretty much as bad as Herod. Joseph and Mary felt that fear. They felt that fear for their son, and through that fear, God's prophetic and purposeful actions were fulfilled. In the nation of Israel, the, north, the northern region of Galilee was considered a rural backwater. And the people who lived there did not have the esteem of those who lived in Judea. To those in Judea, they were a bunch of hicks. And in Galilee, one of the most obscure villages was Nazareth. Nazareth did not even exist in the time of the prophets of Israel. And to be called a Nazarene in Matthew's day was intended as an insult. Yet Matthew writes, Matthew tells us that it was God's intention, as reflected in the words of the prophets, that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. What did Matthew mean by this? I hope Siri would understand that. What did Matthew mean by this when that term was never used by any of Israel's prophets? The answer to that question was not in the identity of Nazarene itself, that word, that term, but what it represented. For Jesus, the fresh start of his life in Nazareth fulfilled God's intention that the Messiah would emerge from the humblest of oranges and at the same time live and grow in safe anonymity. God was protecting his child. That is why those who were looking to destroy Jesus from the moment of his birth, simply could not find him. 
That is why those who were looking for the Messiah to be born in a crash of power or earthly sovereignty or religious orthodoxy really found it impossible to later accept Jesus as Messiah because he had been born in Galilee. And as even Philip, one of the apostles said, what good comes out of Galilee? What good can come out of Nazareth? But those who heard prophets such as Isaiah declare that the Messiah would come as a suffering servant, one to be mocked and ridiculed and humiliated for the sake of the world's salvation, saw in Jesus, this Nazarene, the one for whom they had been waiting. And they believed in him. And they followed him. And in doing so, they gave a fresh start to their, to their lives and to the world, to our lives. This table is the Messiah's geography of grace for us this morning. We journey here. The Lord's Supper is a place for a fresh start in every way. Not just for our resolutions to be better disciples of Christ, but to begin, to begin our spiritual lives anew. The new year is just a new number in an old world. But the Lord's Supper is renewal itself, where we come to receive the refreshing love of God's Spirit. Whoever we are, or whatever we have done before we come to the table this morning, ends, stops, when we surrender our lives to the body and blood of Christ joining ourselves, our lives, to God's purpose for this world. This morning, we gather, the people of God, not to celebrate a new year, but a new life. And our chance today for a fresh start on how we will live our new lives as God's children. Whatever we may face in 2023, good or bad, it is all to the glory of God because we come here. And that makes this moment, this day, and this year the happiest of all because we belong to God whose resolution is to safely keep us in Christ now and forevermore. And the good news is that God keeps his resolutions. Amen. Our hymn of the word is number 146, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. Let us stand and sing. You'll find it in your hymnal. And you'll also see it.